unless I get any frantic signals from Sarah that I've forgotten anything, um, we'll go directly over to Michael now. I'll just say, if you can all keep your mics and cameras off, it'll kind of help with the quality um, going forward. And also, Jim, just um, the upcoming events that we've got on as oh. well. Yeah, um, th thanks very much, Sarah. Yeah, we have a, a, a number of things that are, are coming on and we'll be adding more to this. Um, we, we've got, we know who you are. We will be informing you of these events, but do keep looking out for new ones as they come along. Some of them in our seminar series uh, and some uh, additional, very special one in November, um, which I, I hope you're able to, uh, to get in touch with. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, obviously, you can't say good afternoon back because uh, this is my first time doing a presentation um, using this teleconferencing format, which is very unusual and uh, difficult for all of us. Um, I'm just going to give you a few um, random thoughts about um, what I've seen uh, during lockdown, COVID-19 and drugs. So could we have the first slide, please, Sarah? Um, I'd like to point out as well, um, all ob observations that I'm making have, have been done from the comfort of my own armchair. I haven't been wearing PPE or been able to push in and queue at Tesco's or anything like that. My observations are based on, I manage the Greater Manchester um, local drug information system and early warning system, the Lancashire equivalent of that, the Cumbria equivalent of that. And I was also co-opted during this uh, period onto the um, Greater Manchester response to um, rough sleepers. So part of my observations are based on involved in drawing up some of the harm reduction priorities uh, for that. And that also involves um, doing ring rounds on um, every two weeks basically to all the different 12 hotels that were housing that population. So as I say, th these observations are my observations. I'm not going to go into anything that's um, of a confidential nature, obviously, um, but they're just based on what I've seen so far. So could we have the first slide, please? Um, what did we learn as professionals during this? Well. I think the first thing to say is that drug workers were quite rightly um, seen as key workers um, in terms of priority. Um, I think we all learn, and as someone who I've been working from home for about five years now, so it's probably less of a shock to my system than to many people. And obviously you've got the advantage that you can come to work in your underpants if you so wish. Um, in the morning but there are disadvantages as well and all those things that we complained about when we were working in offices like traveling to work and having to go to meetings are probably things some of the things that people missed um, teleconferencing itself I still haven't got used to and absolutely sucks and I think the other observation is that PIMS o'clock um, has started earlier for many people as well um, the in terms of the teleconferencing i mean it's also been a change in what we've we've heard about both from the online surveys we've done and from comments from professionals in that there are some advantages and some of the some of the people that uh, some of the clients some of the service users have said that they like bits of it but the one thing that keeps coming across is they miss face-to-face -face contact with um, drug workers us key professionals so could I have the next slide, please? What did we expect to happen? Um, I think doom and gloom and mayhem. Um, what we expected was to see something like the 2010 heroin drought, where um, the quality of heroin um, went down to virtually nothing or was, was very difficult to get hold of, that people were using a, a mix of other drugs their tolerance would go and then we would see a great deal of overdoses afterwards. Um, that may um, still happen. 
I think there were certainly fears when we first heard about the plan to um, to to basically put the entire rough sleeping population into hotels that something really bad would happen on a par with you know what the, the kind of devastation we've seen in care homes um, that touch wood that hasn't happened um, as well so it didn't go quite as we expected it next slide please so what has probably happened so far? I mean, you've probably read this endless comments um, in the media that you've seen about um, shortages of this and, you know, prices of that have been hiked. When you actually track them down, quite often they've come from one person. Consistently, what we've kind of heard about is there isn't one overall picture of what's happened. In terms of drug distribution, the market has been incredibly resistant. I mean, you've seen the stories about um, drug dealers disguising themselves as um, delivery drivers or NHS workers or things like that. Um, and there's been uh, a number of people have mentioned about the growth in the, which was already growing anyway, about the online market in drugs. But the, you know, the distribution methods of drug dealers has certainly been more effective than those of people who are supplying toilet roll um, during the holiday. In terms of the actual drugs themselves, again, a really varied picture and Spice is probably a good example of this. Um, the first, virtually as soon as the lockdown uh, was announced, we heard about Spice shortages, which would make sense because the synthetic cannabinoids were coming from China and at that time China was the centre of the, um, the pandemic. Um, but that changed very quickly to a point where within a few weeks in the hotel spice was virtually the only drug you could get hold of and now we're in a situation where we're dealing with increased overdoses because of very potent spice um, that's been around and reports of changed behaviour. Um, when we actually tested some of the samples through the Mandrake scheme, um, we found that there's a new MDMB4E pinaca. There's a new synthetic cannabinoid that um, seems to have appeared. Um, now, whether that's related to COVID or whether that was around anyway, we don't know, but that seems to be responsible for some of the behaviour. Um, there are reports of overdoses and, and a possible death as well in, in the West Midlands that I just dealt with just before I came here. So shortages don't seem to have been the case. Um, there's certainly been um, some changes in drug use, but it's, it's, it's very difficult to try and work out what's actually gone on, but nowhere near the disruption that we thought. Can I have the next slide, please? What did we learn from online trend research? Um, mixed, really. Could I have the next click? Um, some people were using more, some people were using less, some people were using the same. There was probably less drug use overall, and that was partly to do with the fact that, you know, that people didn't have as much money if they were, you know, begging or, you know, involving petty crime to pay for their drugs. Um, some prices went up, some went down, some stayed the same. And the quality as well. Some people are actually saying that the quality increased. Others said it went down, others said it stayed the same. Um, as a researcher, what you'd probably say is more research is needed. But it didn't actually give you any overall picture and there certainly wasn't the, the mass shortages that we were expecting. Next slide, please. Um, we did see some changes, um, certainly benzodiazepines and, and pregabalin were, were major issues with the entrenched group of drug users seen by drug services um, anyway, and that seems to have increased. Um, in the last week we've, we've heard of uh, very potent benzodiazepines being on sale and being used, causing problems. But when we actually looked at it through Drug Watch, it was a completely different, strong benzodiazepine in each area with you know, sometimes a different uh, content to it as well. Um, and I think a lot of it is, is partly to do with COVID. Um, 
in the fact that if you're locked at home, there's no clubs open, there's no festivals. So as you would expect, there's been less MDMA use. Um, and part of it's to do with the weather as well. When the sun shines, young people sit in the park and they use nitrous oxide, which um, leads to reporters going around looking at the canisters found on the floor, which leads to a public outcry and people saying that something should be done and nothing ever gets done because there's not much you can do about it. And the same will happen next year and the year after, probably. One of the um, noticeable things in terms of there, there, there seems to have been a drop in admissions to accident and emergency part departments with overdoses. But one of the unusual things is there's been a number involving psychedelic drugs and, and quite a different range of them as well. Um, in Cumbria it was 2CB, in Lancashire it was DMT. Um, but psilocin powder in, in Greater Manchester, it's been LSD, and in particular, um, recently, it's been cannabis edibles. Um, and again, this is probably a result of lockdown in the, you know, if you're a young person stuck at home with your mum and dad, I mean, you know, smoking skunk is really detectable, whereas you eat it, it's not so much. Um, the quote you can see on screen was, and from a couple of incidents they had what were taken into a and &E in Preston, um, where a young man was found wandering around in his underpants after taking six sublingual tablets of um, DMT. Um, unsurprisingly, um, in the middle of lockdown, he, he was kind of noticed. So probably not the best uh, drug set and setting in ter terms of taking a huge amount of a psychedelic drug. Next slide, please. Um, so what did we learn about the kind of advice um, and information sharing? Um, some of the advice I think was given out was, was well intended but wasn't necessarily the right advice. The advice to stockpile your drugs was the same advice that was given out you know, throughout the, uh, the world as far as I could see. Um, to, this was information given to drug users. Um, quite apart from the sort of toilet roll syndrome, that if people have actually did stockpile their drugs, it would have created a shortage anyway. Um, for the majority of the drug users who are seen by services, this wasn't practical anyway um, in terms of the money they could um, they couldn't basically afford it. But even if they had have done the the, the temptation to use the whole lot in one go and then end up overdosing, I think was meant that that wasn't necessarily the best advice. Um, one of the things I think um, has been skipped around in, in terms of advice is this thing about using drugs on your own or social distancing. We know that quite a large number of overdoses occur when people are using drugs alone. Um, yes, social distancing in terms of avoiding COVID is, is, is a risk, um, but I think that certainly at the moment that using drugs on your own is a greater risk because there's nobody there to help or administer naloxone. In terms of research sharing, I mean, one of, one of the reasons we, we set up Drug Watch in 2010 was because of the lack of information around the heroin drought. And I think with, with one or two exceptions, it's been better this time. Um, researchers aren't necessarily that good at sharing their toys with everybody else because, you know, quite rightly, they've got to publish a paper in, you know, a year's time telling us what happened uh, during this period. But I think there certainly was some very good information sharing with the online research. And, and an example of this was the young people's um, online research that we did in Greater Manchester that Rob and Janine did, um, which was able to say, right, well, we've got this results of this, and while people are doing this and that, one of the things that they're, they're not doing is, is, they're, is they're not being aware of the facts of sharing cigarettes and pipes and bottles. So we got that information, and within a matter of hours, we were able to put out messages on social media to young people. Now, whether that had an effect or not, I don't know, but the next round of research we've done, that had greatly decreased. And I think one of the things that we've also seen in terms of information during COVID is the 
continuation. It's been going on for a number of years now with the kind of propaganda um, around um, e-cigarettes and smoking. It just seems to have got worse. That you know, you you, you can't trust the um, the medics and public health people who are involved in this because the, you know the message seems to be more based on a kind of moral viewpoint than the actual evidence as it kind of comes out. Could I have the next slide please? So what did we learn about national advice and guidance? <clears throat> um, the national uh, guidance to commissioners and providers um, was provided. I'm not going to go too much into issues of uh, prescribing to uh, people because I'm pres I presume Peter's going to go into that into some depth. But I mean, obviously, this was one of the major issues. Um, the national uh, guidance was actually changed a month after being issued. Um, this is the guidance from Public Health England, which said, please note, this guidance is of a general nature and should be treated as a guide. And in the event of any conflict between any applicable legislation, including the health and safety legislation, this guidance, the, applic the applicable legislation shall prevail. Um, now, call me cynical, but that to me sounds like, well, you know, we've left you in a situation where we expect you to completely change your behaviour. Um, in terms of your prescribing practices to take on a, a massively increased workload to do all this without actually seeing people face to face will encourage you to do it um, but if it all goes wrong it's your fault and not ours um, as I said it may just be being cynical can I have the next slide please so what do we learn about the hotels um, for the homeless um, I've used just because if, if I was in front of a live audience, I'd, I'd know that you were rolling around on the floor laughing at the image of Bates Motel. Um, they weren't all Bates Motels, and I think from the kind of learning that we've done, that was you know some of them weren't as good as others. But one of the really important factors was that the quality of the hotels was really really good which seems to be a reason that motivated people who were rough sleeping to go into them and stay in them um, during lockdown. Um, the guidance around the hotels was, was probably even more uh, problematic. And if you've got to choose somebody to have a go at, I'm, a go at, I'm sorry, but PHE, it's your turn. Um, PHE, um, this is still currently up uh, as of a couple of days ago on the Public Health England website. Public, Public Health England will be issuing updated guidance for those working with people who are experienced rough sleeping and living in hospital environments as soon as possible. Um, their definition of as soon as possible, this statement was put out on the 28th, 25th of March, is slightly different from mine. Um, I understand I understand, I've been told that this was because um, the advice and guidance, um, and I don't know the difference between advice and guidance, I have actually tried to look it up and say the difference, but if it's produced as guidance, um, they, were, they weren't allowed to uh, put it out. It was held up by um, somebody in government at some point. On the 19th of May, advice arrived, which apparently doesn't need the same level of uh, clearance. And by the way, the 19th of May, most of the hotels have been operational for several months and we're talking about, um, you know, preparing for closing uh, by the time this arrived anyway. So it was a bit late and I think it was a bit of a cop out. But as I said, that may just be me being cynical. Could I have the next slide, please? So we had to get on with harm reduction priorities. Uh, I, I stress, I, I, you know, my role in this was sat in front of the computer screen talking to, pe to people rather than actually doing it. Um, but the achievement of getting so many um, rough sleepers into hotels in a short period of time, I think was quite an amazing one for the staff who are actually involved in it. Um, and as you, as you would imagine, for the first couple of weeks, it was a little bit um, chaotic and there were lots of different services that never worked before. There were staff with different experience involved in this. So our priorities were, number one was to have naloxone there for on-site staff, because what we didn't want is suddenly to, you know, heroin with fentanyl to appear or something like that. 
and you get a spate of overdoses and deaths in, in one hotel. This thankfully didn't happen. The, the naloxone that was provided was in the nasal form, uh, nioxad, um, and I think this was a great success. <clears throat> Obviously, th there were some staff who'd never worked with this group of people before, and it was a lot less intimidating for, for them than it would have been to give them a, um, the injectable form of naloxone. And this was used on several occasions, so you know, people were saved from you know, the possibility of dying. Um, naloxone was provided to all of the residents who were on prescriptions and, and it was also our priority to offer it to anybody else as well because they didn't necessarily know who everybody was. To ensure that there was injection equipment on site because if they, if they hadn't have been you know people would have reused stuff and things like that and injection equipment includes, included sharps boxes and um, their own sharps in their rooms and things like that. And for safe storage of any of the medication that they kind of had. Now, this probably didn't work um, so well, mainly because I think that the boxes were, were re the storage boxes are really designed to prevent children getting hold of it or anything like that. Um, some of the hotels had, you know, kind of lockable. Um, well, some had safes in, but some had kind of lockable drawers. One of them didn't even have any uh, doors that could kind of be locked anyway. So there was a kind of mixed message from that. And obviously to, to ensure, I mean, as I said, this was just us ticking a box in terms of priority, not in terms of sorting it out or doing it. It was the um, substance misuse services who actually did all the hard work to ensure that there was a, a presence in the service. Um, and again, this was you know, done under the most difficult circumstances. Um, some of it was done by telephone, or whenever people had a problem, they would kind of ring up. And that may have not been uh, people's preference. They would have liked to have seen a face-to-face -face worker, but it was what could be done with the kind of resources that, that were available to people. And as I said, I'm not pretending for any, any substance. This wasn't anything other than quite a remarkable achievement. Could I have the next slide, please? Um, some of the issues, I think if we, if we did it all again, I think one of the really important issues was smoking. About, in terms of the hotels, of this, this population, it's estimated about 80 to 85% were smokers. And there were a number of issues reported with people either going out into groups to smoke together or smoking in rooms. And this led not just in the local, but you know, we heard this from all over, that quite a few evictions came about through people smoking, which, which seems daft when you're with the kind of, you know, the group that you're uh, talking about. One of the great successes was the, you know, the, the smoking teams went in um, and offered them vapes. And this was partly as, as part of a, you know, a plan for, to help people give up smoking. It was partly to avoid things like fires. Um, but as I said, in terms of uh, avoiding evictions, this was really effective as well. And they were incredibly popular. Um, and a number of people have said that, you know, they've, they've not gone back to smoking and been vaping as well. I think one of the other um, difficult issues was around, you know, what are often described as change resistant drinkers. In, I know in some areas, you know, it was described, well, you know, we got a lot of street drinkers and we put them into a hotel and they've just gone back out into the street and started drinking again. And it's like, well, what do you expect from this group? And there were certainly some who went into the hotels who were um, dependent on alcohol to the, the point where stopping suddenly could have been life threatening. Now, some of the staff were able to manage this through giving them donations of alcohol, but it was one of the issues which I think is most problematic for drug services, or drug, I should say, substance misuse services, where there doesn't seem to be any qualms about giving out Class A drugs, but there was this reluctance to get involved in giving people alcohol, which I think, you know, is an issue that needs to be sorted if or when this, this kind of um, happens again. Alcohol was a big problem anyway, each time you got paid there were all sorts of problems. So could we have the next slide please? Um, this is the risks associated with drug and alcohol use one might find in these places taken from the late PHE advice, which as I said, arrived several months after they'd been in operation. So Revident, 
residents leaving the accommodation sites to buy and use alcohol, drugs or tobacco. That certainly happened. Failure to maintain social distancing by residents certainly did happen in cases. People having prescribed substitute medicines for drug dependency stolen from them after collecting them from pharmacies or in their room or taking the whole lot in one go because they were frightened of it being stolen. Sharing of drug paraphernalia, alcohol, cigarettes and vapes. Yes, that happened. Antisocial behaviour. Yes, that happened and drug supply to and by residents. So yes, that happened, and deaths from overdose. Um, yes, there was, there was one death at least that I'm, I'm kind of aware of. Having said all that, you're gonna get deaths and overdoses in this group anyway. And by and large, the, the, the feedback was that people were behaving incredibly well. Um, you know, you, you have to remember this is the most um, vulnerable, needy population in the entire society. Um, some of them, you know, as I said, have been sleeping rough for, for a long period of time. And, you know, there were more comments that people were behaving really well and, and really trying to adhere to it than there were you know, you know, problems that people inevitably had. The, the, some of the hotels have now closed. Um, some, some of them are, are still open. And, the really positive comments about, again, it's the most um, problematic, needy, vulnerable, whatever way you want to describe it, group are in the hotels that are still open. And the people working there are now saying that it's a really, really positive atmosphere and actually feels like a, a community. So, you know, as I said, I'm, I'm trying to pick out things where we could do it better if we we did it again but my involvement was sat in front of a television screen um, as i said and i and i do think the achievement by all these number of services was quite remarkable so next slide please um, so what happens next the the image you can see is from a, a leaflet i designed that went out we we were able to get uh, leaving packs for people so when people did leave um, they had supplies and naloxone and needles and syringes and vapes and um, various other you know, toiletries and other goodies with them anyway. Um, the programme was called Everyone In. Um, they could have, you know, when they left it, they could have called it Everyone Out or uh, now fuck off the money's run out. But the magic money tree doesn't seem to have run out completely. So um, whilst I don't think anybody's pretending that you've you've found a cure for for, for rough sleeping or there aren't you know rough sleeping and, and homelessness is still going on, um, I think for large numbers of people this 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 situation has probably turned their lives around and changed them. Large numbers are still in the hotels. Um, large numbers are being housed in the you know every uh, bed every night scheme as well. So. Um, I think from adversity, a huge amount of good and a, and, a, and a change that people probably would have wanted to make anyway in terms of services providing this, but they just didn't have the money. Next slide, please. So <clears throat> to finish with, um, where do we go from here? As I said, we haven't seen a situation like um, this happened in care homes where there, there, there've been reports of COVID spreading throughout. Um, that could still occur. We, we don't know yet. Um, we haven't seen mass overdoses, or we haven't seen, I think, any more problems than you would have expected within this group. In you know, in a very difficult situation, but we don't know what happens next. Um, uh, we saw as soon as the sun shone that you know illegal raves were coming about and people were back into partying. We're already seeing, you know, stronger benzodiazepines and, and synthetic cannabinoids appearing. We don't know what the heroin market's going to do or what's going to happen after this. But so far, as I said, um, the, who's come out of this well? Well, you know, drug dealers have been incredibly efficient. And for a lot of people, certainly in the hotels, I think this has been an overwhelmingly positive experience. I think that's it. Thank you, Michael. Uh, that that was brilliant, and uh, 
from, from someone as cynical as your good self, it, it was very upbeat. Um, I, I think it was a really interesting reflections on, on the situation. And um, if we can go directly over to Peter. Um, Peter's been um, around for a long time as well. Um, works at, at Change, Grow, uh, Live. Uh, started um, at uh, Merseyside Drugs Council um, a long time ago. Um, worked within the Maryland Centre. Spent, uh, I suppose, the majority of, uh, of your time within the, um, the, the non-statutory uh, service provider sector. Um, and your presentation is going to, uh, again, look at drug and alcohol service responses during the time of COVID. Um, if I can go directly over to you, Peter. Thanks, Jim. <clears throat> I, suppose what I, need, I need to introduce my colleague as well, Nikki Armitage. Nikki is a, a director for the North West as well, uh, for, for CGL. Um, contrary to what Jim will probably spread about me, I didn't bottle it. Um, well, I might have done a little bit. Um, but we thought together between Nikki and myself, we'll give you a much more rich narrative of, of what we need to describe. And that's my official line anyway. <laughs> Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll crack on, um, and thanks to Mike for a really interesting uh, presentation. So I didn't know you'd be able to see us, so I was going to say this isn't uh, myself and Nikki on screen. Um, but what I thought I'd start with, for those people we thought may, may be listening who don't know who CGL is, Change Go Live, give it a quick, very whistle-stop tour and not pay much, much uh, detail to these slides, but um, it started way back in 1977 as a group led by volunteers uh, providing homeless uh, uh, support to people who are coming out of prison and at risk of going back in. In the 90s, that quickly changed to drug and alcohol support, and the first members of staff were recruited. Um, quite th you know, through to the 2000s, really, and that the next decade was really a rapid period of growth. and changed its name to CRI, Crime Reduction Initiatives, and really, really took off across the country. Um, jumping ahead to 2016, really quite established, and lots of people didn't like the name, Crime Reduction Initiatives, and it didn't fit what we did. So that there was a name change to the current name, Change, Grow, Live. Um, and then we thought we'd sort of stabilise quite steadily, and, you know, we were looking at consolidation and... and, and um, Unfortunately, 2017 seen the demise of Lifeline Project, which is really, really sad for the sector. Um, and unfortunately, lots of contacts were going to be abandoned because there was nothing in place. So Chain Grow Live stepped, stepped in and, and took over those contracts, which is, took us to today, really. We've got over 4,000 staff, um, about 1,800 volunteers or so and growing, so, uh, and projects across the country. So that's a whistle-stop tour of, of how we got here. Um, I, I think our values, are, the reason I put it on is it's really important about, I think Nikki will agree, how, how we make our decision-making, how we operate from a day-to-day -day basis, how we recruit and select, how we do HR decisions, uh, even prescribing decisions are based on the values, which Nikki's going to talk a little bit more about it in detail, but I think put that on there because it's really important about how we go forward uh, how we've responded to COVID initially as well so harm reduction um yeah th the reason that we've included this as a slide is it's the organization is grounded in harm reduction principles it's it's what we do it's 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 how we respond to people and it, it's ingrained right through all the treatments offer but what COVID immediately had us doing is is drawing upon them principles of care straight away and you know what's the most basic principle of harm reduction it's keeping people safe isn't it keeping people alive so they can get to a place where they can get better um i was sort of going around the the, the, the region delivering training on giving and receiving feedback before covid and 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 it was based on the radical calendar book that kim scott wrote and in that it talks about getting comfortable being uncomfortable because no one likes getting feedback or giving it in general and little did we know that we were all about to be thrown into a world of uncomfortable decision making and we had to be comfortable with it. And I think, again, Nikki's going to talk more about that, about decisions that were made that were really uncomfortable, but based on a consensus and based on the greater good for our service users. 
Okay, so um, so how did we respond to COVID? Well, we viewed it as a national critical incident for change goalies. Um, and we, we had to adopt a hierarchical manage approach um, to adapt to constantly changing and escalating information. And that was moving away from where we'd been heading and striving for before, which was really a bottom up approach from staff and service users. So it was a big change for us. We focused a lot on communication. So we wanted our communication to work upwards and downwards. And we had national, regional and service based meetings established really, really quickly. And that allowed us to share information rapidly, um, ch share change guidance and share good practice and innovations. We really focused on understanding what our service users were experiencing and also focused on staff wellbeing, recognising that this was a massive change for staff and if they weren't in a good place, they weren't going to be able to deliver services um, for our people. And we, we established local business continuity plans and really there was five main priorities for us. So the first one was medically assisted treatment um, and that was about us engaging and supporting people to stay in treatment who were prescribed and also making it really easy for people who weren't in treatment to access support and treatment and particularly those who might have dropped out of treatment early on. We had to make some really bold and significant decisions in terms of prescribing and dispensing um, and, and that is a, just one example of that um, unhealthy, uncomfortable decision making that Peter talked about. In terms of alcohol, PIMS o'clock, we recognise that for some people their alcohol use increased during lockdown and we wanted to uh, offer a really good quality alcohol service for new people entering treatment. And we also wanted to make sure that we could continue to deliver all the um, diverse alcohol interventions that, that we were offering. Peter's already mentioned harm reduction. Um, it's the foundation of our work and it runs through everything we do. So that was a real priority for us. Homelessness and outreach, as, as uh, Mike explained, we recognised that many of the people that were living on the streets or who were homelessness had multiple complexities. So we really ramped up our outreach provision and we were in reaching into hostels and hotels, um, supporting people and partner organisations. And for, for kind of other service users as well, we recognise that to stay connected, to stay engaged and stay in communication, our outreach provision was really, really key and that's worked really, really well for us. And finally, um, that one of the other priorities was safeguarding that always has been and always will be um, a priority for us and we've really focused on this during COVID. So practically, what did we do in terms of service delivery changes? Well, we focused on continuing to deliver a service and trying to reduce the spread of the virus. So I think the good news is our services remained open. We're really proud of that. Our, our doors were open, our buildings were open. Um, in large integrated services, we, we might have seen certain buildings closed on certain days, um, but we were, we were proud that we remained open and were there for our service users. Communication was important, so a lot of our interventions moved to either telephone or digital uh, support and we made great use of our well-valued volunteers, peer mentors and service user representatives. Getting staff working well and efficiently with the right equipment was really important for us um, and they were supported to work at homes. I think I think we're frozen. Can anybody else hear anything? Peter, no, no. completely frozen. Uh, Peter, can you hear us? It's okay now. I, I'll try it. Use Jackie McBann. I'll try and give him a ring and let him know that they're frozen. Yes, thanks. We've lost them.
just while we're waiting, um, if uh, we, I obviously have all your email addresses um, from signing up to this, if you don't want to be included on our mailing list, can you please drop me an email and I will take you off our mailing list. I'm putting um, my email address in the chat now. Um, otherwise, I will I will send you an email. Um, I just realised I've sent that privately to Jim instead of everybody. Um, I will I will add uh, add you to the mailing list and let you know about upcoming events that we've got. Okay, if you can just bear with us a couple of minutes. Um, are, are people familiar with the chat the chat boxes down the side of the the screen? I mean, do feel free to even if I've got questions, I'd, I'd be interested to know who we've got out there because I've got a screen full of names. I have no idea where most of you are from, either geographically or, or from organisation point of view. Um, so that, that would be useful to know that. And um, also, I've just seen a just seen a question there. Um, how do you get to the ACE talk in October? Um, the links will be re uh, released on Eventbrite, and you'll get an email about them, and that's how you can register and um, for that talk as well. But so far, no other links for any other talks have gone out. Sorry about that. We lost connection, unfortunately. Have you got us back now, Sarah? Uh, yeah, I just can't see your yep. screen. Can you hear us okay? There we go. Lovely. Thank you. Okay. Okay, we'll try and get back on track. Uh, so I was talking about staff cluster rotors. So they allowed us to move teams around um, should an outbreak uh, or someone ex get symptoms of COVID that would allow us to bring a different cluster into the building so we could maintain service delivery. We initially stopped um, kind of any face-to-face -face groups understandably but what emerged was our service users were telling us that they missed that connection so we started and they naturally emerged to develop some digital groups and they were um, they ranged from kind of really informal groups support groups um, recovery evenings quizzes and they're they're so so popular and people are just telling us they really really like and value those our medical assessment and review um, also took place over the phone and digitally and it allowed us to start people into treatment, review people and make decisions about their prescribing and dispensing. Um, I've already talked about prescriptions and how we made some uh, big decisions um, and that really was key to us making good balanced decisions about reducing visits to pharmacies. We also moved our needle and syringe exchange provision to mobile um, and more recently into a postal provision. This next slide just represents one particular service manager's experience where quite early on in COVID, um, she was supporting staff who needed to shield, she was supporting staff who needed equipment to get to work at home, those with childcare arrangements when we were quite in the, I suppose, the early stages and um, people were quite concerned about COVID. Um, but it demonstrates how we're so proud that our staff teams pulled together, staff went over and above, um, and the service manager was just taking a moment, looked out the window and she saw a member of staff with a desk in the back of the car, hanging out the boot of the car, and an office chair in the front of the car, and a full big desktop um, computer on the back seat of the car. So yeah, we had to really pull out all the stops to carry on and deliver the service that we did. We talked about engagement being really important. So a really important uh, response to COVID was our, how we maintain contact with service users. And for whatever reason, some people weren't engaging with us. So we actually issued thousands and thousands of mobile phones to our service users and they remain in use. Uh, they're our line of communication with people. Um, and we're really, really uh, pleased that we did that and that's working well. We really also, uh, increased our naloxone distribution and training, recognising that there's an increased risk of overdose um, and also refreshed our safe storage of medication. People were going home with uh, increased volumes of me uh, methadone or buprenorphine and we wanted to try and keep as pe people as safe as possible. Partnership work has never been so important um, and we've had such a positive response. Uh, Mike referenced it in his presentation 
uh, partners such as the hospital, social services and criminal justice agencies. There's so many examples I could talk about. Um, one example was working with the Salvation Army. We trained the Salvation Army staff to be able to support dependent drinkers to reside within the Salvation Army accommodation and also with their contingency planning should an outbreak of COVID happen and their staff needs to shield or isolate. Another example, um, the Everybody In project. So a number of providers in Greater Manchester came together um, to support homeless populations and Change Goal have actually received the High Sheriff Special Recognition Award, um, just being one key partner in that, in that project. And we're really proud of that. We've really found that during COVID, we've been able to reduce bureaucracy and change things quickly. So we've introduced and piloted intelligent fingerprint testing. Um, and this is a way that we can test people, um, initiate prescribing, it's less or even non-invasive, and it allows us to do that with social distances. As I mentioned before, we've also continued to offer a really good standard of alcohol provision. A lot of our services offer digitally through telephone or Skype. Um, we, we offer remote reviews with a medic or an NMP. We hold alcohol multidisciplinary team meetings. We've even continued to offer uh, detox, home detox. So we send blood pressure monitors through the post and we've continued to refer for detox and rehab. This slide is a bit difficult to follow, but if you look where the green, um, the green lines start to increase. This demonstrates the type of, the way we contact these people. So the green is by telephone. Um, the the grey bits at the very bottom were video or Skype contacts. Uh, the pink was in writing uh, and the yellow was in person. So you can see that pre-COVID, the yellow, most of our contacts was in person. Um, but more and more telephone and video is increasing and, and proving really successful with our service users. Over to Peter. So yeah, looking at illicit supply, um, I won't say too much because I think Mike's covered it really well. Um, but yeah, we, we knew that the illicit supply market was going to be disrupted and it was going to cause some issues. Um, overall, I, I say not repeating what Mike said, it, it seems to have stabled out quite well. Um, only yesterday, the Guardian reported in Merseyside that there was a click and collect service available for heroin and cocaine. I think that was available beforehand, to be fair. But it also uh, notes that there were people were checked at checkpoints. I haven't seen a checkpoint yet, so I don't know if that's the media again or not. But to be dressed as nurses or delivery drivers, which is, I suppose, slightly amusing, but um, it also shows, if it is true, that the that drug dealers are no different than any other organisation and they will adapt and change to the market and, and, and of PPE and, and contact delivery, just like getting a, a, a Donamo's delivered really. Hopefully you get your heroin quicker than I get my Donamo's. <laughs> um, so this, um, this slide is a national sort of picture of CGL's needle and syringe provision, which was um, taken that week one is January and it's always quite a low week, so that, that equates for that number. But you can see on average before week 12, which was lockdown, it, we were averaging about 800 plus, nearly 900 uh, contacts per day across the country. And then very worryingly, uh, COVID hit and it that halved uh, almost overnight. So that was half the contacts, half the equipment and, and half the amount of you know, stuff that people could access for clean injections equipment. But as, as Nikki's already pointed out, we really ramped up the outreach offer. We wrote some guidance for staff about doing mobile needle exchange and door-to-door and -door service and almost taking the Amazon delivery model where we were dropping people people's equipment off at the front door and knocking and stepping back. So it was almost like a click and collect service. And as Nikki said, we're just about to enter a postal agreement service with a national provider where people can order uh, the clean injection equipment from their own home and it'll be delivered the next day. So this next slide, we did actually have Jeff Crouch, our national data manager with a voiceover, but technology being technology let us down the last minute. So 
between Nicky and I, we're going to hoof it a little bit. But basically, it, it covers our math table. And math, for those listening who don't know what math means, it means medically assisted treatment, which covers people who are on opiate uh, substitute prescribing, predominantly methadone or buprenorphine. And we introduced math some time ago, led by our medical uh, director, Prun. And it was multiple reasons really but one main aim is making sure we try to get people on an optimal dose and when people are on an optimal dose as we know they can use less illicit drugs and get on with better functionality in their lives and Matt's split into the four stages which I'll now uh, pass over to Nikki who's got more of a I'll, I'll give it yeah, a go. Okay. So um, the, the audio would have described that the data shows that we've got 30,000 people in treatment prescribed nationally, which is a third of all the people in treatment in the country. We've been collecting this data for about two years. Um, and during COVID, what's been really important is we've not asked, had to ask our staff to do anything additional, but it's given us some really, really useful information. So there's, there's kind of four stages to map. So the brown group that you can see at the bottom is those in the induction stage. So those who just started to be prescribed in the first 28 days of uh, prescribing. Matt stage two is the red and amber groups. Um, and Matt stage three is the green and gray. And then Matt stage four, which you can hardly see, is those at the top which, who are detoxing um, to zero in the next three months. At the top, the purple group is the uncategorized group. Um, and the, the way we work out someone's illicit use, I suppose it's important to say, is either their drug test in the last month or their self-report self top data within the last six months. And if we've got neither of those, then they would go into that top purple group uh, as uncategorized. There is further, um, the groups are split further. So the red and gray groups uh, are, are split further. And this shows about our optimal dosing. So those um, in grey are those below optimal dose on 60 mils of methadone or 12 milligrams of buprenorphine. And those in red are using illicitly on top um, and are not optimal dose. So really, the data shows us, what it shows us that we've had um, significantly reduced illicit use over during the period of COVID. Prior to COVID, we started to see um, the number of people using illicitly shift from into the number of people using illicitly reduce. Um, but as COVID hit, you could see a significant reduction in that. And I suppose what's important to say is um, prior to COVID, our urine testing and self-report data were kind of aligned. They weren't quite, they weren't exactly the same but it was reliant information. It was really, um, it, it was very, very similar. And as we were now, obviously we report, um, relying on a lot of self-report um, data at the moment, we're seeing that there's a significant reduction in illicit use. And yeah, and I think if Jeff, we would have heard, if we would have heard from Jeff, he did mention that it was a big thank you to frontline staff who, who have collected this data over a two-year period. And at last, they're seeing some, some, um, some. I wouldn't say it's not positive when people are using on top. It's, it's personal choice, and we work with that. But you know, those people who have stopped using on top has increased, and I think it's good to see that data and frontline staff are, are, are responsible for, for getting that data. So it was well done from Jeff. Okay, this next slide, um, I suppose we're going to talk about reviewing risk. So risk has really been important to us during lockdown. Um, and at the start of lockdown, we had to make really good balanced decisions about people's prescribing regimes. Really because the impact of that is it, it, it kind of has an impact on how many times someone has to leave the house and go to the pharmacy. So for those who don't know, uh, people could be on different regimes so some people with the most uh, experience with the most challenges might be having to go to the pharmacy daily, might be on supervised consumption, whereas somebody who's been in treatment a while um, and achieved some stability and were not using illicit, they may have to go to the pharmacy only once a week uh, or twice a week. When lockdown happened, we had to make some changes really quickly, but we did have to consider risk. So what we considered was 
uh, trying to keep people in treatment. People were really concerned and worried about um, the virus, some people. They didn't want to leave the house. We also had to consider where pharmacies were at. Some had closed, some had restricted access, and some weren't able to offer the same level of service that they did before. Um, and we also felt a responsibility to try and keep people safe from COVID. Our usual practice prior to COVID was to have a documented individual risk assessment that we did collaboratively with the service user as a minimum every 12 weeks. At the point of lockdown, we had to change prescribing for 33,000 people. Um, and we did this using the knowledge of uh, what we know from our, about our service users through case histories. Um, and we, but we didn't have an individual documented risk assessment for everybody um, at the point of lockdown that took into their prescribing, took into account their prescribing regime. So we prioritized individual risk assessments for the most risky service users, for those with respiratory issues, perhaps some mental health concerns, uh, who'd experienced a previous overdose or, or were living in unstable accommodation or who were homeless. So we worked through our service user population using these priorities and we completed individual risk assessments using our knowledge and our partners intelligence holding MDTs. In late April the Care Quality Commission uh, asked us to explain our approach which we thought was a, a, re a really reasonable request. Um, and we provided lots of documented evidence about why we made the decisions that we did. Um, but in, on the 7th of May, they actually issued enforcement action uh, against the organisation. And what they wanted was that we completed an individual risk assessment with every service user and that we updated our data to them every two weeks. The, the visuals, the slide that we're, I'm showing here shows that on the 12th of May, when they, um, just after the enforcement action, We'd already completed 60% um, of individual risk assessments with our service users nationally, either through a multidisciplinary team meeting or an NMP or medical review. Um, by June the 5th, 100% of our service users had an individual risk assessment. That work continues. We're updating our risk assessments continually. Uh, we're continuing to submit data to the Care Quality Commission. We are expecting some targeted inspections based on the risk assessments, um, but we also have had some informal positive feedback on our approach. So we are maybe going to sort of talk and finish off uh, the presentation around sort of learning, but obviously one of the biggest learning curves we can do is listen to our service users, how COVID has impacted them and how our response in our treatment offer as being adequate or not. Um, and overall, we've had a mixed bag as we will expect across the country. We have worked with Mark Drake, our national service user lead, and uh, Mark's actually running a, a, a national survey at the moment. But initial findings are sort of a mixed bag of people who have told us that they didn't actually like coming in in the first place, uh, no offence, which was okay to hear. It wasn't something that we were really old favourite, you know, from, from time to time, yeah, but a large number of people have said, look, we prefer this, this is better, give me a call, check on my well-being, I'm doing okay, if not, I'll let you know, and that, that that's good, and that's definitely going to form part of our offer going forward. Equally, there's been lots of people who use our recovery groups and our centres for health and well-being connection and connection with peers and professionals and, and they really can't wait to get back in. So a bit of a mixed bag, but we, we know that it's it's all learning for us to take forward and it will definitely inform our treatment topic going forward. These quotes are just two examples of that really. Um, one is talking about how the Zoom meetings have really helped the person keep connected to the peer group but can't wait to get back into the recovery centre. And the second one about how the Zoom meetings, which is the digital platform we use for groups, has really helped them stop feeling isolated and lonely, which we know is a really, it's life or death for some people, so that's a really important learning curve for us. Equally important for us learning going forward was staff and volunteer feedback. Again, mixed, mixed, mixed across the organisation, but we know that it's given people more flexibility to get out and do more assertive outreach and follow up, get from behind the desks, which has been really good for them and learning for us about how we think about future service provision. Homework, and as Nikki's mentioned, 
something we wouldn't really have considered really in any mass for, for, for key workers before COVID, but we've now seen that it can work, people can work from home to some capacity uh, and, and function well. So that's definitely again going to form part of our forward offer. And these hundreds and hundreds of examples of staff going above and beyond that, if we get time and q and A, I'm sure we can answer. And, and what I think has really jumped out for me for real-time staff feedback was our chief exec agreed to do regular national sort of open open questions via a digital platform where lots of people have took advantage of and asked challenging questions. It was originally called an audience with Mark, but he, put, he pointed out that he wasn't the Pope and he, he, it wasn't an audience. So it's now called an afternoon with Russ and Mark, who's our national uh, lead for communications. Okay, I'm going to talk a little bit about post lockdown planning. So, when we started to think about this a while ago, uh, we really grounded ourselves in our strategy that we refreshed uh, about six, 12 months before COVID. So, what have we done? Well, we've moved away from the bronze, silver, and gold approach, gone back to our normal governance arrangements. We have four key governance groups that happen each month. We're in the process now of taking a really not slow, but considered approach to completing service-based risk assessments. These are a health and safety executive requirement, um, but going above and beyond that, we're actually doing individual risk assessments with every single staff member and every single volunteer. And these individual risk assessments focus on people's personal circumstances, um, their concern, we're trying to understand their concerns, their preferences, what's going on in their family, um, you know, what would they like their working life to look like going forward and trying to match that. It's not always possible, but with service provision. What we've really noticed as well is um, the different experience of people. So both Peter and I have not really liked working at home. Uh, I thrive working in an office, meeting people, driving to work in the morning, coming home. Some people are really loving the flexibility of working at home working uh, you know across different hours working before nine after nine it fits in with family commitments and it's allowed them lots more flexibility and improved their well-being so we're trying to really notice and learn from that in terms of what will get started in terms of service delivery cgl are not going to direct services to start doing as an example i don't know alcohol groups on this date what we've what cgl have uh, produced is a, a roadmap template that will be used locally and completed with uh, service users, with staff, with our commissioners, with volunteers, and is aligned to the government five stages approach. So it takes into account the type of service. So if it's a drug and alcohol service or smoking cessation or YP service, that's really, really important. And obviously, considering what's happening with the virus locally as well needs to be considered. Um, so that that that's in process at the minute, and that's where we're going to focus on what are our priorities, what needs to start first, and how do we keep people safe. Going back to the strategy, looking at doing things better, all, all throughout COVID, our teams and our service users, have, we've been asking them, and they've been telling us what they notice. So we've looked at what's worked well, what innovations have um, happened and have been well received. What do we not want to go back to that we did before for some unknown reason that people don't really think is useful or popular? Um, but having an honest look at what are the gaps as well. In terms of working together, we've really, we've always been, we're a national organisation, but we're split into regions and we've always really aimed to try and gel nationally. It's never quite worked, if we're honest, but we've always strived strive for that. COVID has forced us to become a, a national organisation that really does work together. So as an example, we hold Q&A surgeries twice a week on different topics. And you might have 250 people on those calls and it allows practitioners at every level to ask questions, share solutions, overcome challenges. Um, I've learned more about people's families and all the dogs and all the kids. Um, and it's, it's just really allowed us to gel together and become a proper national organisation. We've also shared our guidance and so we've shared our MAC guidance, our harm reduction guidance with other providers and we've um, accepted and, and welcomed other providers' guidance and used that. A real example of good partnership working together um, in London, CGL led across provider partnership of NHS Trust um, to, 
to provide support to several thousand homeless people who were moved into hotels during the pandemic. So the service briefly provided a SPOC, um, it was cross provider role of recovery workers and clinicians, it provided advice, information, a coordination function, some drug and alcohol training, and it's been so, so well received and so positive. Telling our story. So we're at the point where we, we really, um, we've got a great story to tell. We've learned so much. We're really humble about what we're learning and we'll continue to do so. We've had a number of research inquiries who want to work with us so that we can formalise what we've learned. But we're really hoping that our story can influence guidance and practice and really um, hold the voice of service users um, as most important. That's it. Thank you. Thank you for making you did step in and, and help me out the last minute, and I think it's the enormity of the size of the organisation. It certainly dawned on me, and, and Nikki, being a, a director for the Northwest, has got more exposure to the areas that I, I, I have. But I hope we've covered everything, and if not, I'm sure we can take questions. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Uh, and thank you, especially Nikki. Uh, I feel off because I've said such nice things about the other two and I've said nothing about you. Uh, thank, thank you very much for, for the presentation. It, it, it was really enlightening. And um, I, I mean, the thing that I got from it was, uh, I suppose, from both presentations was about the, I suppose, the innovation and the dedication of, of, of staff and the partnerships um, and the cooperation, commitment and goodwill uh, of the clients. Um, and I suppose also the innovation and uh, dedication of the drug dealers. Um, but I found that really fascinating. And if I can bring um, Michael, uh, can you come back in? Hello? Yeah, <clears throat> try it. Great. Great. Haven't really had a lot of questions through as yet. Um, there was one question from Bev Mercer, which is uh, you went on to touch it, uh, Nikki and Peter, but um, it, around in particular around prescribing, um, I suppose from an organisational point, if you just go over again, what what you see that will there be a change of direction or a change of focus in? prescribing within CGL and then if it can go to Michael on any observations or thoughts he may have? I think it's it, yeah it's a good question and it's one that's getting asked across the country I think of all organisations uh, Jim I think it's too early to say I think from uh, an organisational perspective we, we made the decisions we made to keep people as safe as we could um, as we know that the guidance beforehand was for people to have a more or less a seven day maximum take home dose, which we, we doubled to stop mm. those visits to the pharmacy. And I think it, 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 it stopped hundreds of thousands of people going to the pharmacy on a daily basis by doing that. Um, I think going forward, working on the best principles to care for people, really, that we want to work in the most least restrictive way we can with each individual based on their, their, their own circumstances and, and, and personal risk. So I think it's early to say, and I don't really want them to say about that. Just, just to say that what people are telling us is that they love the flexibility for the majority of the users. They love the flexibility. They love not having that stigma of having to go to the chemist every day. They feel empowered. It's really helped them. Some people are telling us, and I suppose it's important to point out, that they like the structure of going to the yeah. pharmacy every day. Um, so I think we've we've not rushed into changing practice and prescribing back and based on the fact that local lockdowns may happen, there's quite a few in the northwest that are um, you know, where the virus is increasing. I think we're we're in that stage where we're just making local decisions. Michael, any thoughts? Uh, yeah, I mean I think it's like any crisis. I I, I remember back to the you know when, when HIV or HLV three as it was then called came along, we you you used that to get some positive benefits, and the positive benefits in that stage was getting needle exchange in place. I think the the changes that have been really positive in terms of prescribing, um, hopefully, are here to stay, um, and this has been used as a catalyst. I also think with naloxone as well. I mean, you know, we all know that the the wider provision of naloxone is a really positive thing. 
anyway because you've got record numbers of drug related deaths regardless of whether you get fentanyl up here at all and the wider provision and in particular the training of extra people who are working in hostels and various situations I think it's all been very positive so you know yeah I mean I don't think anybody knew we would end up here but I mean you know let's take the positives out of it. I think someone mentioned it Mike as um, being like a really big massive natural experiment now, it wouldn't have been an experiment you chose to do but it is it, I guess it's talking results of that experiment really and as you say the positives you know They've shone through, they've shone through, people feel empowered, they feel trusted um, in the main. And in the main, people have sort of took con more control over the, the drug use. Um, so, yeah, it'll be interesting to see how it does pan out. Uh, just picking up on a, a, a question, uh, well, a, a point that's been made, uh, and do, do you see a, a, a difference in the, the relationship between um, service provider and, and clients, and, and the, I suppose a, in some ways a, a democratisation, sorry, I pinched their word and made out it was mine, um, uh, you know, but that relationship, do you see that a, a change has happened? I think it already has, yeah. I think um, whether we like it or not, there has been a power imbalance between a provider and a service user, and it's something that we've tried to address, but it exists whether we like it or not. And I think by service users telling us in quite a large number, actually, I don't like coming in, uh, I'd rather you give me a call and we arrange some voice to voice sort of intervention or face to face by FaceTime than, than actually trekking all the way down to the local. The centre, then that, we've got to listen to that, and I think that's gone some way to address that power imbalance uh, as a starting point. But yeah, just, just one um, <coughs> quite early on when we changed our guidance, so we were telephoning people, uh, and the guidance was to aim to telephone service users twice a week, check in, ask them how they're doing, try and support them, and um, obviously try and understand what's going on for them to inform our prescribing decisions. We did that. And, and quite a large number of service users said, can you stop ringing me? You, you, too much, you're caring for me too much and just started ignoring our calls. So we had to listen to that um, and ask them how they wanted us to communicate, how they wanted us to engage. And that's been interesting. We feel better when we live talking to them twice a week, but actually what they wanted was something different. So yeah, we've had to really change. We've had to really listen more than ever before. Um, I, I know we're running short on time, but in the spirit of uh, democratisation, it's been pointed out that I should shut up and uh, um, at risk of the whole thing coming down. Does anyone have any direct questions they want to put to any of the speakers? Peter? Yeah, hi, Ben. Hi, Mace, you're right. Yeah, uh, Peter, it, do you think that following um, coming out of COVID, uh, the fact that you've done all this risk assessment and so on of 33,000 clients, do you think that it could be the end of supervised consumption for a lot of the clients? Um, I'm sure lots of clients would, 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 would like to think that and, and like to put a case forward for that. And I think it's the time to listen to that. As the case goes forward, I think it's probably important to remember why supervised consumption was introduced, isn't it? And, and it yeah. was to reduce drug related deaths. Um, but I think, I think historically people have ended up stuck on it maybe when they, they shouldn't have done. And, and I know CGL has done a lot of work using an ASCII tool to, to address that. I think mm. now that we've developed new tools that'll be more effective and. We'll, we'll just go with the national guidance and a balance of listening to individuals, how they present. As I said before, I think this has given us an opportunity to, to review that and work in the least restrictive way we can with each individual. Mm. Thanks, mate. I think that's a, a really good point, Peter. And I think, I suppose, my, my concern is from, from the other end of the spectrum is that... Um, concern that funding formulas may be only for based on people picking up fortnightly and <laughs> that are pushed to a different form of service delivery it has to be um 
sort of needs led. Um, just to, if I can have one question to, to the, the three of you, which is, um, I suppose, obviously nobody wants us to go back into lockdown, no one wants another um, outbreak, uh, COVID type thing, but what would you want from government if there was if there was something in relation to um, policies or information, what would you want before we went into a lockdown again? Um, I think I think it's about better collaboration with providers. I think when we look at the audit guidelines, for example, there was a good collaboration in reviewing them. There was a massive working group, so that was probably a good piece of work, an example of collaboration. I think before before we sort of get ready for a second peak, if it came, which hopefully it won't, but if it does come, I think we've got to, A, I think providers have worked better together and we've shared, as Nikki said, as much information as, as we can, all information with our, our colleagues across the sector. I think it's um, it can go better than that, it can, go, it can get improved. I think from a government perspective, I think the it needs to be more cross working groups, more collaboration around decision making and the you know, the guidelines for prescribing is one example of that maybe I don't know what you then what to that. Um, I suppose with a more long term view historically, I think what we've really noticed is the complexities, the multiple challenges of the people that use our services. They don't just arise overnight. These are people who generally um, have got long histories of substance misuse. So I think more focus and more investment in early intervention, prevention services with children, young people, I think that's what I would ask of government because that's where we need to be investing and focusing now to, um, to support improvements in our generations of the future, really. Thank you, Michael. Yeah, I'd go, I'd go along with all that. I, I think it's, um, a lot of it is to do with the magic money tree. Um, I think what one of the, the really positive, and we're all be, it's very unlikely to be positive about anything, to be honest. <laughs> but I think one of the, the, the positive things is that if you're provided with the money, you can do a lot. You can do an awful lot more than we're doing now, but you need the money. So it's not just a question of putting people who have been rough sleeping into accommodation. You need the wraparound services that go with that. So if you've got those services and you've got the money to do that, um, I think we've learned from this time and I think you can do a remarkable job. But that's the, the, the big if, isn't it? Is, is, is if you're provided with the money to be able to do what you know you can do. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, we're, we've run out of time, so it just leaves me to thank our, our three speakers today you've, you've been fantastic and I, i've certainly enjoyed it and see from the comments that people have found it really useful and um, i thank yourselves for joining us and ask you to carry on supporting these um seminars um and to keep in touch with us and to come up with new ideas of things that you want to hear or to us to to put on and of course a big thanks to uh, Sarah Fox for, for actually doing all the work for it. Thanks very much and I'll see you all again soon. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thanks for inviting Thank us. Thank you. Thank you. Um, for anybody wondering, the this the, uh, this presentation was recorded and I'm going to try and figure out how I can send them to people. Um, and once we talk to IT, I've just, just seen your comment, James, so I'll, I'm going to try and figure it out. Will you drop me an email to, to um, and I'll see if I, what I can do.
I will do. That'd be great. Thanks, Sarah. Cheers. No problem. Thank you. It looks like it's been great. Thank you. All right.